that that meditation is just kind of a nice analytical reflection to do with yourself every now and then. Um, did you come to any new insights about yourself in terms of just kind of recognizing a pattern of some sort of entitlement or some sort of justification that was like, oh, right, yikes, got to work on that note self? Or um, did you feel like, yeah, yeah, yeah? <laughs> or, you know, how did it go for you guys? I had a, I had a terrible thought. <laughs> Terrible thought. Um, yes, I did. I had a terrible thought. Um, I um, belong to Spotify with my daughter-in-law, and I don't live in the same house. And I'm thinking, mm, that's not the right thing to do. Right, right. Uh, home sharing yeah. is the definition home sharing. of home. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I yeah. like that you're thinking in those terms, although I'm guessing that the policy is something like up to five members, but it yeah, could it be is. they have to be in this, the same house. But if it's Yeah, no, I don't. Home, we don't live in the same. No. So, so I'm going to check the to... policy because you might actually be fine. Um, but uh, it, it's worthwhile thinking in those terms, right, to just check, you okay. know, is the way in which I'm sharing information the way in which it was intended to be shared? <laughs> It would be a great, it would be a terrible thing to give up, give up all that music. <laughs> you crack me up. <laughs> I love that when Eleanor says I had a terrible thought, it's like the most benign. <laughs> no. <laughs> but no, I'm glad you're thinking of those, those terms. It's like, no, to self, let's check some of the terms and conditions of some of the things we've been sharing with friends and family and make sure it's all above board and you know, make sure that uh, it's like number of people, you know, whether it means in the house or not, just check how many people are allowed to be shared with, et cetera, et cetera. It's just worth checking, right? Because with technology, it feels like a victimless crime, right? It's like, no one is hurt by this. Why is it a big deal? And it's not such a big deal if no one is claiming ownership of things, but if there are people claiming ownership of things, you know, they're basing their livelihood on it and, blah 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 all sorts of practical reasons but more importantly is the dharma reason of is it a good idea to have the assumption that i'm entitled to things is that a good way to live the assumption that i'm entitled to things you know that's that's the thing we want to look at and what is my relationship with other people's possessions you know like ownership is a myth, you know, uh, property is a construct. Sure, all those things can be true for you as an individual, but does that mean it's true for everyone else? We want to be, you know, polite and considerate of other people's boundaries, et cetera, et cetera. But really everything with the Dharma is about cultivating this habit that just does not want to harm. Yeah, this intentional non-harming. And whether it seems benign or not, oh, do you want to let in Jessica? Oh, there she goes. Um, you know, to just really have that examination of what is my mind doing? What dance is my mind doing to justify something I know to be a bit dodgy? You know, and is that good for my practice? That kind of stuff. Thank you. Yeah, gently, gently. <laughs> yeah, Leslie. Um, okay. I have inside of my, um, inside of my life, uh, and this is before um, I took my vows, but still, no excuse. Yeah. There was dodgy strategies afoot. It's happened to us all. <laughs> yeah. What's the pattern? And what can I do moving forward? Yeah. You know, what's, what's what I want to do less of? What's what I want to do more of? And the last thing I want is for you to feel burdened by your lifetime of mistakes as the result of having examined the five lay vows. What I want for you to do is to see the patterns and make conscious adjustments to do better in the future without identifying as now I'm a good person, then I was a bad person, because that just sets yourself up for failure, right? And who needs that kind of identity anyway? But you say to yourself, what was the dance that I did internally that allowed me to do these kind of dodgy things? And how can I minimize it now that I know better, you know? And, and you do your best, but um, don't drag around a bag of rocks of your mistakes. Do a good Vajrasattva session. Do a nice act of generosity to someone. Let it go. 
problem. And I'm what yeah. I'm also doing is my gather up atonement these days too. <laughs> but yeah, we're not like a you know cat of nine tails whip ourselves like feeling bad doesn't make it better. Right? That's that's the conditioning that our society tells us. It says if you feel bad about it, that kind of makes up for having done it or you're kind of allowed to do the bad thing if you feel bad, <laughs> as if feeling bad is the purification. And feeling mm-hmm. bad has nothing to do with purification. Purification can be joyful. It's like a joyful reveal of your own good heart and a development of it, right? So it's like you're cleaning off the dirt that was never you. You're cleaning it off, cleaning it off. You're not thinking, I am so bad and I must atone for my sins. No, you made mistakes because you're a human being with ignorance, just like everyone else. You know, don't identify with it, right? The, the main piece of purification is regret, which means seeing a fault to be a fault. It does mm-hmm. not mean guilt. Guilt is the bag of rocks of feeling badness. And the Buddhas do not want you to feel bad. Feeling bad doesn't help. That is not a part of the picture. Regret is not feeling bad. Regret is a clean acknowledgement of whoops. You know, if you spilled water on your carpet because your cup was too full, you'd be like, oh, whoops, I should not fill the cup so full. You wouldn't think like I'm a primordial evil being for always overfilling my water cup. Like, you know, you'd just be like, whoops, do better, you know, right? And this is the way we want to think about it is, oh, that was a mistake, changing, gentle, clean, simple. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) But um, yeah, no, I'm I'm glad that it's coming in. And, And just remember, Buddhism is not a heavy, oppressive thing, right? Buddhism is like a, hooray, this is not inevitable, all this. <sighs> hooray. Phew, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Lee, Lee, you've got your hand up? Yeah, thanks. So this is a, a general refuge question um, that I hear a lot uh, from people, and I'm wondering how you answer. Um, I love your, your um, slides in the beginning where we talked about what refuge is, what it's going toward, what it's going away from. But a question I seem to hear from a lot of people, and I remember going through this myself before I took refuge, was it seems so foundational and so um, interwoven to everything else in Tibetan Buddhism that it becomes hard to distinguish what you're agreeing to or accepting or identifying with and what you're not by, ju- by just taking refuge. And so I find I want to help people Mm. say, no, it doesn't mean that you've decided that forever you believe in reincarnation or that green tar is really green sitting on a white cloud. Like, it's not really about that. (laughs) Um, It's so specific. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And you don't have to start wearing a tuba or shave your head or, or like, please don't make your room maroon or whatever. (laughs) Like there's some things that are culturally Tibetan. There's some things that are, um, you know, theological kind of views and analytic wisdom insights that you may or may not ever get on board with, but Mm. that doesn't mean you can't take refuge. But then I don't want to like sort of water down or simplify or say, oh, just refuge is just means being a good person because it's not really that either. Yeah. So I'm just wondering how you work with that. Sometimes I, I share the like the simple verse, train your mind, you know, refrain from doing harm to benefit when you can train the mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha, that stanza. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And I say, if you're on board with that, we're good, but I don't know if that's really a very good answer or not. So I'm wondering what what you do with that. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and like you, I I know what the Geshe's would say and, and I know what more modern Geshe's would say. And then I have my own, you know, relationship with it that evolves over time. And, you know, the, the technical thing is you can be what is called a Buddhist tenant holder who is not really a Buddhist, but, you know, can be, but doesn't have to be, meaning that you understand that all conditioned phenomena are impermanent, that all, all contaminated phenomena are in the nature of suffering, that all phenomena are empty and selfless, and that nirvana is peace. And those four tenets make you a Buddhist tenant holder, and it's a philosophical understanding of a worldview. But to be a Buddhist Buddhist just means from the depth of your heart, your primary spiritual connection is with the Buddha, his teachings, and his community, 
which sounds simple until you ask which teachings, which I think is where you're getting at, right? Which teachings exactly? Like, do I need to believe in Mount Meru and the four continents? Like, you know, even after his holiness says, eh, it's a metaphor, you know, <laughs> or whatever, right? You know, and do I get to be so simplistic that I just go with that simple quote of his holiness, which is my religion is simple, my religion is kindness. Lovely, wonderful, but what does that even mean? What is kindness really? You know, is it's not just being like a little sweetheart, you know, going around fixing stuff for people and being a healthy helper in some kind of superficial Pollyanna way. Um, I, I think that it boils down to understanding some of the core tenets of Buddhism with an open mind that says there's nuance that I might not understand and there's commentaries I might not agree with but I do believe in cause and effect. Mm. I believe that negative actions lead to harm. I, I believe that positive construction, constructive actions lead to benefit and happiness. And whether you're framing that karma conversation in terms of past and future lives or not, to be a Buddhist, you do kind of have to be on board with that. Yeah. So, you know, the, the nuances of karma and how that plays out over lifetimes front and back and the way that plays out in the specifics of the conditions of your body and your life and your relationships, that can be a moving and evolving conversation for yourself. But you do, I think, need to genuinely believe in the basics of cause and effect. Yeah. And have some sort of deep belief that non-harmfulness is the thing to aspire to at all times, if possible. Yeah, so non-harmfulness, cause and effect. Everything else is details, <laughs> right? Everything else is details, but I think that you do genuinely need that. And what is non-harmfulness? You know, it's gotta be imbued with ideas of interdependence and interconnection and an understanding of really basic just biology that what hurts me hurts you, what hurts you hurts me, that we are all infinitely interconnected. So non-harmfulness is not only kind, but logical. Yeah, so if you're feeling like the Buddha's way of presenting that works for you, take refuge. And if you feel like there are many things that point to that and you don't wanna put all your eggs in one basket, you know, have a few breaths of pause and kind of think about it. But to have your primary spiritual refuge, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, it doesn't mean you can't use other things. It just means your core belief, right? So the tricky thing is like, for example, when I became Buddhist and when I was 12 or 13, I was going through confirmation class in the Methodist church where you become like an adult in the church, right? And you go to all these classes and whatever. And at the end of it, you get baptized as an adult in the church and it's a whole thing. And I said to the, um, to the minister, I said, I think I'm Buddhist. And she was like, well, that's all right, honey, you can be Buddhist and be a Christian, you know, because they're like groovy Methodists, right? And um, there's fundamentalist Methodists too, which may not be so open-minded, but she was like, oh, that's fine, honey. And, and, I, and I said, but we don't believe in God. <laughs> and you do, that's a big difference. And she's like, well, what if, what if God is love? I said, yeah, we're on board with that. But if God is creator, we're not on board with that. And that is a big fundamental difference in tenets. So I 100% see the value in believing in a creator God or a creator or a creative energy that is sentient and separate from the rest of sentience. I see the benefit of that, but that is not the worldview that resonates with me. So I don't think I can be Christian and Buddhist, but I can think that Christianity is very useful for many people. And if someone reads St. Francis's prayer, you know, I'm going to love it. I'm going to think it's the best thing ever and agree a hundred percent, you know? So it's not like I have to say, now I reject the Sermon on the Mount, even though I think it's beautiful. I just say, I'm a Buddhist and there are some things about Christianity that I really treasure and I even take into my own life. And I appreciate the charitable actions when they're not missionary and creepy. And I appreciate this and I appreciate that but I'm not Christian, I'm a Buddhist, right? So it's, it becomes also an identity conversation too. 
yeah. So I don't know if that, that sharpens the horns of the dilemma, but I think that to be Buddhist, you do have to believe in cause and effect. Quickly, that you're talking about entitlement and victimless crime. Teresa was talking about um, the way in which thinking of stealing in terms of an entitlement mentality is what hurts oneself because before it was easy to justify it because it's a victimless crime. But if you think about the harm it does to kind of one's psyche and having that entitlement mentality, then that does uh, strike a chord. Is that a good summary? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like that. So slowly, slowly, right? But then if you got your refuge, then you can do your upgrade. So the upgrade, um, which is perhaps naughty to call it an upgrade, but anyway, I will is uh, bodhicitta. We talked about this last night, but when we're talking about bodhicitta, what we're talking about is a mind. So it's not a thought. It starts as a thought that becomes a mind, meaning a main mind. So it's, it's a tricky distinction. You know, it's a sky or clouds distinction. It's not like the clouds aren't part of the sky. But what we're talking about here is something that becomes so fundamental to the way you think that you're never not having your thoughts informed by it. Yeah. So that means every moment of the day, whether you're thinking I'm going to get a cup of coffee or I'm going to have a chat with my friends or I'm going to go for a walk or I'm going to do my job, whatever ordinary thoughts you're having are like colored by this intention to become enlightened and that you want to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. So in order for bodhicitta to shift from a thought to a mind, a main mind, is just repetition. And once you've done that, you are a bodhisattva, a being with uncontrived bodhicitta. So then we look at these strategies, like how do you actually get yourself that altruistic? And the substantial cause of bodhicitta is great compassion. Then there's a couple of techniques they talk about in the Lamrim, and we'll talk about those a little bit tomorrow and do mostly just meditations related to them. But what's gonna get you really to decide that the purpose of my life is to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings? You need great compassion. So what's the difference between compassion and great compassion? regular compassion and like compassion plus. Um, does anyone have a feeling for the distinction between those two? So compassion is the wish for all beings to be free from suffering, right? Which means you have an understanding of suffering and you have an understanding of freedom, right? So it's different than empathy. And it's different than like thinking the best of people. It's like you're able to see the suffering and the potential for freedom simultaneously, which is why there's no such thing as compassion fatigue, but certainly there's empathic distress. Certainly there's empathic distress. You can get yourself upregulated seeing the suffering of someone else and it can really start to weigh heavy on your heart and your nervous system can be affected and all sorts of things can be affected by being in the presence of someone else's suffering. But if you're getting that experience, it's not because of your compassion. It's because of empathic distress, which means you're seeing the suffering without seeing the potential for freedom. Yeah, and you're identifying the person with their suffering and with too much this moment in time of all of their troubles. Yeah, you're not seeing this person too will be a Buddha someday. This person too can never ruin their potential no matter how messy it gets. And even if this life they're in right now is a wash and a tragedy, still they cannot ruin the fact of their potential for perfection and happiness and health. And if you can hold that, you can see any suffering and it's not gonna disturb your peace, right? But if you see only the suffering, of course, it's gonna to get to you and it's gonna weigh you down. So compassion is the wish for all beings to be free from suffering. You see the potential for freedom. You see the reality of suffering. You see them simultaneously. You're holding that space, wishing them well, lovely, lovely. 
what makes it great compassion? <laughs> Intuitively, what do you think? Just guessing. Um, I, I would guess then taking action to help that person. Yep. yep. Okay. Yep. Nice. Nice. And maybe not even like physical action so much as personal responsibility, but it's saying it's not enough to want people to be free of their suffering. I need to decide that is part of my life to make that happen, which is like a trap waiting to happen, isn't it? If you think about it the wrong way. Uh, I'm going to like fix people. I'm going to, I'm going to heal people. I'm going to be the great savior of the universe. Like how obnoxious, right? You like that's creepy people, right? Bless their hearts. But you're kind of like, I'm fine. Thanks. Right. You know, folks that get a little bit like that, or maybe we get a little bit like that. So we're not like all up in everybody's business, right? We're not like, how's your marriage? How's your job? How's it going with the garden? We're like not in people's business, right? That is not what great compassion is. We're not like trying to fix stuff. We're not like the grand mediator. We're not the magic politician, okay? What we're saying is an inner mentality of, it is so important for me to try and soothe the suffering of sentient beings and bring them closer to their potential. I must prioritize my spiritual path. Yeah, I have to prioritize uh. my spiritual path. For their sake, because again, that ripple effect thing that happens, the more in alignment with your path you are, the more your ripple effect is of benefit to others, the more powerful you are as a condition to others. And so then it's easier to be in that place of deep, deep listening with people where you're listening for their wisdom in order to give it back to them. Yeah, you're not thinking, how can I give them the answers? You're listening for the fact that they already have most of them, but sometimes they don't hear themselves, right? People are 90% there. We can only help with kind of that last 10%, but we have to be hearing the way in which they're moving in the right direction and kind of offer them steps to finish that section of whatever path they're on. Can you give an example of that? Yeah, you know, okay, well... Let's think about some there. Well, okay. We probably all have a depressed friend. Do we all have a depressed friend? I'm guessing. Yeah, we all have a depressed. We are the depressed friend often. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So <laughs> there's depression with insight and there's depression without insight, right? Like, so if you're someone who is depressed, but also in the Dharma, you probably have some depression with insight, right? Like, you know, the monster, right? You know, when the black dog is nipping at your heels and you're like, if I let myself fall into this, I'm going to be in the vortex of doom for a good couple of days, weeks, months, even years. If I think about my teen years or something like it could get really bad. So what I'm going to do is train and not believing this nonsense now while it's little. Mm -hmm. And if I forget and I fall into the hole again, a friend of mine might say, Hey, What's going on? <laughs> You're in the puddle. Hey, hey. And if you have insight, you go, oh, I am. I am. And you still feel horrible, but you don't believe what horrible is telling you. And because you don't believe what horrible is telling you, it kind of rolls through that karmic seed finishes and you kind of shake your head clear of it and get back in the saddle, mixing a number of metaphors. But you know what I mean, right? If you do believe what the horrible is saying to you, then it ripens another seed and another seed, and you're just on a whole momentum of depression seeds, and it just, it can go on for ever, right? It can go on for a lifetime. So that's what happens before you kind of like break through and get some insight with your depression. So you can't inject someone with that insight that depression lies because it feels 100% true when you're in it. And then when you shake your head clear of it, you're like, things are not quite as dark as that. However, some of the things depression notices are true, but my feelings about them are not accurate. What it sees can be quite true, and there can be a wisdom in depression, and I don't need to squash that. That can be very useful. But the conclusions it comes to, like, therefore, what is the point of anything? That is nihilism. 
and not true and not helpful, right? So once you have your little like mini breakthrough, it's not like you're going to just magically stop having depression, right? You have a depressive habituation in your mind stream. But once you have that moment of insight, the duration is much shorter. It comes, you see it, it rolls through, it finishes. You can be deeply depressed for three minutes, right? As opposed to three weeks. If you've got a good friend, they can say to you, oh, you're in the puddle. And that can wake up your self-awareness and help it roll through quickly. But they can't give you that initial insight that understands that depression lies. That's something you have to come to as an individual through a deep dive into the essence of what it says to you over many years, probably with some therapy and some friends and maybe medication and whatever things are useful to you to get that window that knows that depression lies to deeply know it, that's yours. But if you're falling into that trap again, someone else can help get you out if you already have some methods to get yourself out, right? They can reach the hand, but not if it's not gonna help if you don't know how to reach back, for example, right? Or like, you know, with your kids, right? If they already know how to do something, but they forgot, you can remind them of a step and then that'll kind of trigger the rest of the steps that they do know, yeah? I think, you know, when people are in problem solving mode, but also kind of whinging, do we, what do we say in America, not whinging, whining, right? <laughs> when people are whining about their life um, and, you know, kind of complaining about difficulties at work, in amongst the whining is sometimes pockets of insight. And if you're the friend listening to that, you can get overwhelmed and be like, oh, for God's sake, not again. I get it. Your boss is a tyrant. Okay, moving on. But, you know, you can shift gears and think, can I listen for some of the ways in which they already have found their own solution and give them their own words back to them? Yeah. When you say this and this and this communication is impossible, what I hear you saying is it's impossible. Do you want to change? <laughs> right. Or when you say this and this is impossible, but here they'll listen to me. You say, oh, I hear you saying here they'll listen to you. <laughs> You're not giving them something they didn't already have, right? But you're giving it oomph. Yeah, so, so great compassion is, is more than those little strategies, but it's going along similar lines of, it is my responsibility to be the best condition I can be so that people can actualize their potential. I'm not giving them a potential they didn't already have. I'm not forcing a knowledge that they're not ready for. I'm just creating the best possible conditions. And in order to do that, I need to go deeply within. Does that make sense? Yeah. So great compassion and bodhicitta are the talk of tomorrow. Um, thoughts so far? Yeah, the great compassion. Do you want to unpack that a little bit more? We've got a few minutes for, for questions. Or we could do a sit. Would you prefer to do a sit? Little sit. I see a, a thumbs up for a sit. Ladan has quick question then sitting. Yes, uh, um, I would like to, to, I have this uh, thought that um, popping up. The, like the um, cause and effect and bodhicitta is relate, related, I guess. But uh, it, we are like catching a train that has been on the on the rail from like beginning less time right yeah 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 you're not wrong and, <laughs> and we are some somehow pushing it but where is our um choice in all of those things because everything is arising for because of before i don't know i i'm getting trapped in it and it's uh is there free will is that yeah, are you having, yeah. is there free will question that's always a good question <laughs> is there free will yes and no is the answer yes and no um relatively absolutely there is um but feel like it's interdependent right so your choice to do something different is not just based on you in this moment. It's informed by all of the moments that came before and all of the things around you. 
so in order to make better choices, we have to start kind of playing with conditions that are going to bring out the best in us without giving those conditions too much credit. Sure. It's, it's forever a paradox, right? So it's yeah. like some friends, you are more ethical and more kind and have more elevated conversations about better ideas. And so be with them and do that. But don't think that that, that is the reason why you can. They're just helpful conditions. You know, and uh, there's a lot to be said for organizing your life in such a way that the conditions bring out the best in you, mm -hmm. but they only bring out the best in you if you're deciding to have the best brought out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we do a short sit. Nice straight back, back on in. A few deep breaths. <sighs> Steady in the body. And you just think quietly to yourself, I practice lead to the fulfillment of my potential in order to benefit all. Tapping back into that bodhicitta. And then visualize in the space in front that the embodiment of refuge in bodhicitta appears in the form of warm golden light. that all of the qualities that you have and aspire to grow further, take this image of warm golden light. And if you feel comfortable, you can put the image of Shakyamuni Buddha in the center of that golden light or leave it simple. And now think from the heart center of this refuge and bodhicitta embodiment comes a stream of golden light that curves in an arc and goes to the crown of your head. A stream of golden light from your refuge's heart to your crown. And nectar light flows through as if it's a tube all the way down and through your whole body, pervading it with light. Filling you up. And as you become filled with golden light, imagine that it activates all of your latent ability to connect with refuge and ability to connect with bodhicitta or grows what is already there. All of this light waking up your heart. And then we add the Shakyamuni Buddha mantra to the visualization, bringing even more strength to it. 
Continue the mantra under your breath. Tayata Om Mune Mune Maha Mune Sohat. Tayata umune mani mahamune so. And so think that this brilliant, warm, golden light of refuge in bodhicitta dissolves and absorbs into you, blessing your body, speech, and mind. And we dedicate. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. The wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, the incomparably kind Supreme Tenzin Gatso. May you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. <laughs> Ch 
So thanks very much, everybody. And um, I'll see you tomorrow for a half day on Bodhicitta. And if you have any lurking questions, uh, write them down and we can talk about it tomorrow. Thanks, folks.